Welcome back to Intro to World Music. Today we're going to finish our unit on Latin American music, and we're going to start with the Ecuadorian <coughs> San Juan. Um, a San Juan gets its name from what? Anybody tell me? St. John. John, right, which is the translation. And what is, uh, what is the uh, event? St. John, what is, uh, what's, what's going on there? Why does it get its name from that? It's what? It's a religious festival, right, okay. There is a religious festival associated with St. John, uh, John the Baptist, actually, and uh, this is a big festival in Ecuador, and the Quichua people um, have a big festival that goes on during this time, and there's a lot of music associated with it, much of which is in this particular form which takes its name from the festival, so this form of music is called the San Juan, and it has a particular rhythm that is associated with it. Did anybody run across that in the reading? <coughs> what rhythm is associated with the San Juan? Short, long, short. Short, long, short. If you were notating this in traditional music notation, you might be notating it as 16th, 8th, 16th. So that ta-ta, 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 ta You see that particular rhythm going on. Short, long, short. Short, long, short. Short, long, short. You hear that a lot happening in this style. It doesn't always happen at the beginning. Ta-ta, 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 ta-ta. That's one particular possibility. Or ta-ta, 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 ta-ta. That's another possibility. You see both of those in the examples that we have in our CDs. So. Be aware of this particular rhythmic characteristic as you talk about the San Juan. And, and also be aware of the form of these. They are strophic, which means what? What is a strophe? A verse. So they tend to be songs that have many verses. And so sometimes they are almost like a ballad. A ballad being a story that's told in singing, usually by verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, and so on. So these songs are strophic. They have a phrase length that often lasts for eight beats. And of course they have the short, long, short rhythmic motive. <clears throat> Your book refers to a term called isorhythm, meaning that the second half of the phrase, the second four measures, has the same rhythm as the first four measures. And so you have examples in your book showing how this works. If you look, for example, at the transcription of the Quichua San Juans on page 437, your author has taken 12 different songs and shown how the rhythm of the first part and the rhythm of the second part is essentially the same. Again, walking and wandering is an important metaphor in these songs. And we have two classic examples in your text, starting with Muyu Muyari Warmigu, uh, which, is a, which is in the Quichua language. And it is for harp, voice, and golpe. Review with me, what's the golpe? Someone hitting the bass of the harp. Right, somebody using the bass of the harp as a drum. And so that person is called a golpeador. And you see the picture of it on page 434. These are the performers that are actually playing this piece. And on 435, you'll see um, a description of this song, including the translation. Please return, dear woman, please return, dear old lady. The place in which you've stood has a dear flower has grown. So uh, the idea of wandering, thus the need to return, is an important theme in this song. As you listen to this song, listen for that short, long, short rhythmic motive that we've discussed. This is track 10 of your CD.
So the thumping sound that you hear keeping the beat there is the golpeador. In this case, the short, long, short motive happens on the second beat. So you get the ta, 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 okay? There's the short, long, short happening on the second beat. In the second example that you have on your CDs, the short, long, short happens on the first beat. And it's a song called Iluman Tiu, or The Man from Iluman, that is found on page 440 of your text. In this case, the short, long, short happening on beat one. This is an ensemble uh, made up of guitars and canas, violin, drum, and voice. Highly popular in the 80s and the 90s. And um, the interesting thing about this piece is that the musicologist who, who uh, explored this whole thing finally discovered that the true meaning behind the song was that the man who wrote it was suffering from tuberculosis and thought he was going to die. And so he was writing this song to say, remember me, remember me when I'm gone. Well, fortunately, he ended up surviving and uh, um, was able to perform the song many other times after that. But the song still says that same principle, that same idea of uh, remember me when I'm gone. And I like to uh, make the analogy to a song from the musical Rent, if any of you know that show. Um, One Song Glory, does anybody know that show, Rent? Okay. And, uh, and so the character in the show who has been diagnosed with the AIDS virus uh, sings, he just wants to have this one song to have this one great glorious moment before he goes. Okay, that's, uh, that's the, the sentiment of that. And uh, ironically, uh, Jonathan Larson, the composer of Rent, uh, died of an aneurysm the night of his, uh, well, the night before his opening day on uh, Broadway. So it was a, an incredibly tragic thing that happened back in 1996. Uh, if you don't know Rent and you don't know the show, uh, or the story behind it, uh, you should definitely explore that. But it's this same principle of um, everybody wants to leave something behind so that they'll be remembered. And whether that's uh, music or in some other form, it's a common human set, uh, sentiment that runs like a thread through, through many, many cultures and through all of us. And this song is no exception. This is Iluman Tiu. In this recording, uh, you hear the instrument that we've discussed before called the cana, which is a, a Latin American flute. Um, this is a sort of a cheap version of it that you can buy in uh, tourist attractions. But uh, the same principle is there of uh, the Native American flute in that it is a six hole flute with a thumb hole in the back. And so the fingerings are like recording recorder fingerings, but they're uh, but they're a, a little simplified from that. Uh, but uh, there are many, many examples of Latin American music that uses the cana as, uh, as its melodic instrument. Um, probably one of the most famous of these is called El Condor Pasa, and it's not an example that's in your book, but it's a, a song uh, originating in Peru that had um, a, a lot of world influence because you hear this song performed by a lot of groups uh, worldwide, uh, not the least of which was Simon and Garfunkel back in the 1960s who used this uh, tune as uh, a, a song that became very popular for them. So if you wanted to learn to play it on the cana yourself, uh, it wouldn't be a hard one to learn. Um, even I can play it. And so it's got, it can't be too difficult. Uh, listen, to, uh, listen to a little of it, uh, the, the melody. You 
You know this one? You heard this before? Yeah, uh, just that little fragment of it uh, should be enough to uh, alert you to the fact that this is a well-known tune. Let's listen to a version of it on YouTube to, um, to show you what I mean. Now, if you take a look at this ensemble, see if you can tell me where you think they're from. So in switching from the Zamponias to the Canas in this example, you hear a real change of timbre and also uh, a change in the level of vibrato that's being used. Because when most players play the Canas, they, they use quite a bit of vibrato on there. Vibrato being a vibration in the sound so that it switches from being a straight tone to more of a vibrato tone. And, and uh, flute players out there will excuse my, my lack of abilities in, in producing this, but okay, where it literally is, the tone is literally moving up and down very quickly to create a, an effect called vibrato. And you hear that happening with the Cana players on this recording, although um, much faster than that particular vibrato right there. Now, um, does anybody know, anybody have any idea where this group might be from? Hmm? Where? Well, there's, there's one or two players in there that I think are uh, from Peru, but uh, there are, most of the players in there are actually from Denmark, and that's where the, the group is based. So um, the Andean music phenomenon is truly a worldwide kind of thing, and, and you see it in every country, uh, the influence uh, going on in cross-cultural kinds of ways. So this particular group is based out of Denmark. And uh, I think most of the members of the band are actually Danish and, uh, and not um, from uh, Latin America. Now, just as a frame of reference, uh, the, 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 the version of El Condor Paso that really made it famous was done by Simon and Garfunkel back in the 60s. And so just, just to compare their version of it, um, Let's listen to this. So in that case, uh, Paul Simon came along and put words to the, uh, the, the centuries-old melody of El Condor Pasa and uh, turned it into a very effective pop song uh, back in the 60s. As we continue with our chapter, I mentioned the Andean ensemble being a worldwide phenomenon, and um, that is certainly the case. You see a lot of crossover kinds of pieces and groups. Um, you have some examples on your CD. The first one is a group called Chaskinaque, and uh, you'll see them pictured in your text. They are um, a husband and wife group. And um, I think he is actually from Switzerland, and she is from Peru. And uh, they have a, a very nice uh, act that they do worldwide. You'll see them pictured on page three, on page 449. And um, their performance, Amor Imposible, uh, is uh, on CD track 13. <laughs> And as you listen to this music, um, listen to the rhythm that the harp is playing and see if it is not reminiscent of the rhythm that we studied earlier from the Ecuadorian San Juan, that short, long, short rhythmic motive. So uh, a lot of those uh, Latin American elements coming into this particular cross-cultural example. Es imposible dejar de querer. 
harpita. This is more of a refined, more professional kind of group. The, the, the harpists that you heard before, like Don Cesar uh, Mukenki and, uh, and also Efrain and Rafael, the two performers that you also see on the San Juans, um, they, they are more folk performers, whereas um, this group, uh, the, the, um, the duo uh, Chasquinaque, is uh, more of a professional, refined kind of sound. Yeah. But it's the same kind of harp. And if you, if you read your text about these harps, uh, you'll read that uh, the, the, the pins that are holding the strings in one place or another are often made of animal bone, in the, uh, particularly in the, whole, in the folk harp tradition. Uh, and uh, the, the, the strings themselves, what are they made out of? They're made out of, yeah, stomach lining or, or gut strings from an animal. So, um, and, and, and in fact, that's what strings for violins were made out of uh, in, up until about the, probably the 19th century or so. So, yeah, uh, uh, animals uh, had kind of a hard existence when they were being raised uh, to make strings for instruments, when you think about it. Uh, most uh, European and, and American string instruments are now made from other materials like nylon or, um, or steel, but uh, uh, in some cultures, the gut strings are still used. Was there another question that I didn't get to? Okay. Um, let's move on and look at the last couple of examples that you have on your example. Uh, Me gusta la leche is uh, an Afro-Ecuadorian San Juan. So, so it's a San Juan, so it's in that same short, long, short style that we've been listening to, but the performers are from Ecuador of African descent. Yeah, they're on page 444. So you'll find their picture on page 444. And uh, you'll see that uh, three of them, at least, are playing pretty standard-looking guitars. And then there's a drum in the front. And then there's an instrument that's cylindrical in shape. And um, it's sort of hard to figure out what it is from the picture. But what it is is called a huiro. And I have an example here that um, was lent to me. It's, um, it's a beautiful instrument, actually that's uh, quite decorative in design, but it is a gourd-based instrument. It is basically made out of a gourd. This one is carved to look like a fish. Uh, and what they do is to dry the gourd and then cut little ridges along one of the sides to create the opportunity for a scraping sound that sounds like that. The word Gourd in Spanish is huiro, G-U-I-R-O, pronounced huiro. And so that's what this instrument is called, even in, uh, in English. Uh, when you're going to be playing percussion, uh, they will say, go play the huiro. The typical rhythm associated with the huiro sounds like this. You hear that particular long, short, short kind of rhythm going on. Usually it's not played with a pen like I'm doing today, but uh, I couldn't come up with a scraper on short notice. So um, just about any, uh, any implement can be used to, uh, to scrape the huiro. You're going to hear that instrument being played in our Afro-Ecuadorian example here called Me Gusto La Leche, or I Like Milk. Find the translation here on page 445. Listen for the huiro. Hear the scraping? Hear that?
I think that in this example you can also hear that short, long, short rhythmic motive going on in some of the uh, vocal parts. So it sort of permeates Latin America, that, that rhythm that we've talked about today associated with the San Juan. Okay. Uh, so um, um, any questions about this piece? I like milk. There you go. Uh, the last example you have in your book is uh, Atsukar de Kanya. Atsukar de Kanya, which means what? Sugar cane. Sugar cane, right. And this is an Afro Peruvian lando, which is a particular kind of song, um, quite sensual in nature. And this is the one that involves this instrument, which we discussed before. What is this? It's a jawbone of either a donkey or a horse or possibly a zebra. Uh, any of those animals uh, might find their jawbones being used for this purpose, uh, in which the teeth are going to rattle when it's struck like so. And so you're going to hear that particular rattling sound in this example. Now, in America and Europe, that particular sound has been transferred into this version, made out of metal and wood. And um, in Spanish, by the way, the jawbone instrument is referred to as a quijada. Quijada. Q-U-I-J-A-D-A, -A, Quijada. I'll write, I'll write that down for you. That's the jawbone instrument. The instrument we studied before, the huero. And then the more modern equivalent, this instrument, which gets the same kind of sound in a different way, and it, it uh, tends to ring a little longer, is called a vibra slap. And so it, it sort of describes what it does. You slap it and it vibrates. It's as simple as that. There's the vibra slap. Compare the sound of that to the quijada. The, uh, the authentic version doesn't vibrate nearly as long as the vibra slap. So the, uh, the lack of authenticity uh, is overcome, I suppose, by the length of the sound. So as you listen to this recording on your CD of Atsukar de Kanya, see if you can uh, determine which is really being used, because you will hear that sound in this piece. CD 4, track 17. Translation of this song can be found in your text on page 467. I go out in the morning to cut sugarcane, 
The morning star always accompanies me. Machete in hand, heart of wine. The river, my brother, the sugarcane harvest my destiny. The sun rises behind the mountain and flooding the valley with the aroma of the sugarcane. And, uh, and so on. It gets rather sensual, uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the style is really brought across very well by the singer in this example. Let's listen to a little more. So you can follow along in your book, pages 467 to 469. <laughs> And that song goes on quite a while. It's very enjoyable to listen to. Uh, it, uh, it, it's the um, kind of thing you can put on and, and, and listen to while you're doing just about anything. So um, let's review just a little bit here about Latin American instruments and about the styles. Um, the three instruments that we looked at today, the cana, the huiro, and the quijada, are these indigenous or imported instruments? All three of these are indigenous instruments. And what does that mean? It, it, right. They originated in Latin America. They were not imported from another culture. So if you had to make a list of the instruments that we've studied in Latin America, and whether they are indigenous or whether they are imported, uh, what would be in each group? In the, um, in the indigenous group, Imported group, okay. So in the indigenous group, we might have what instruments? The ones we just looked at, right? The cana, what else? The huiro, what else? The zamponia. The quijada. What else? Ocarina. Ocarina. The conch shell. What else? That's a pretty good list. There are various drums as well that are certainly indigenous, but we haven't actually studied any of those in specific terms. What about imported instruments? Guitar. And um, the guitar in all of its various forms. You'll Trumpet. Trumpet? Like in, for example, mariachi music, yeah. Yeah, guitar, trumpet, harp, and violin. Right, these are all instruments that have been imported from other countries, most notably Spain, and have found their way into Latin American music over the centuries to the extent that um, many people who perform on these instruments may feel that they are indigenous when in fact um, they were imported long ago. 
So, so be aware of these. And uh, as we approach the next test, uh, be able to associate each of these instruments perhaps with um, a song.